come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. It is great to have you back here. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as you were sharing about the brain, I uh, couldn't help but remember the Bible verse from Psalms where the psalmist says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, how can we believe the idea that we just appear, we just happen to be in this world? We have a design, we have a purpose, we have a meaning in life. So we are here uh, in order to understand more about God's plan for our lives. People are sometimes terrified to approach this topic, the mark of the beast. And I believe, um, besides under, beside the fact of understanding that salvation is only by faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior, this could be one of the most important topics, as I said, beside of the fact of understanding that Jesus is our Savior. So before we actually tackle this topic tonight, I'd like to pray. Because it is important for us to discern the spiritually things in a spiritual manner. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit can be our teacher. So let's bow our heads together as we ask God's guidance. Father, we've had a great day, and uh, we want to praise you for this opportunity that we have to learn more from in the Bible. Lord, we pray that uh, your truth will really hit home and help us to understand your will for our lives in this year, 2017, and the call you are inviting us or the stand you're inviting us to make. Help us, Lord, to uh, have our ears tuned in, to concentrate, and may your spirit carry the words into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when, when people think of the mark of the beast, uh, they usually think of uh, MasterCard or the barcodes that they find on the shopping uh, products. They think of numbers tattooed on people's foreheads. However, uh, the Bible goes much deeper into this topic and it gives us clear understanding about what the mark of the beast is all about. And just briefly before we jump into this, just to remind you, in the previous sessions as we have looked at prophecies, we have seen that when God predicted something, it was 100% accurate. You know, no room for error. And he was very meticulous in giving us elements, specifications, and say this is going to happen. So the same thing is going to be with the mark of the beast. It is important to understand that uh, the warning against the mark of the beast is the strongest in the entire Bible. You have different warnings throughout the Bible. But the warning against receiving the mark of the beast is the strongest in the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we're going to find that why is God so strong in His language that we should be aware and careful and on guard that we may not receive the mark of the beast. The message of warning comes from Revelation 14, and it's part of the three angels' messages, and is the third angel's call. As we have seen, we unpacked angel number one for a number of uh, evenings. We looked at the idea that the time of judgment has come. We are meant to worship the Creator. We need to, to fear God and give glory to Him. So that was angel number two. Sorry, no, angel number one. We are going to deal with angel number, number two tomorrow. So come along tomorrow, Sunday at 6 p.m., but angel number three, his message is this. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, bear in mind the issue at stake is worship, my friends. The battle that started in heaven between God and Satan was about worship. And Satan has carried that battle down to earth. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to pay allegiance to? So if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his head, he himself shall also drink of the wine 
of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of His indignation. So God is saying, if anyone worships the beast and receives the mark either on forehead or on, on the hand, they will experience the wrath of God. Because the issue at stake is who are you going to worship? Well, since the, uh, the, the warning is so strong, it's only uh, you know, fair to think that it is a mark that can be understood by us. It's not something that is cryptic and cannot be deciphered. It's something that we as human beings can understand if we want to understand. So that's our challenge for tonight to understand what is this Mark 666 or the Mark of the Beast all about. As you go through the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, you're having contrasting pairs. Uh, one one, from, one from God's side and the other one from the side of the beast. You have the marriage supper of the Lamb that represents the reunion of the redeemed children. Whose reunion, everyone? Redeemed children. But then you have the supper of the vultures or birds that represents the destruction of the wicked. So you've got two feasts, in a way you can say. It's a good one for God and not so pleasant for the other group. You've got a pure woman and not so pure woman known as the prostitute. Pure woman, we're going to talk more about tomorrow, represents the church of God, represented as a delicate, beautiful woman. But the prostitute is the one that has not been faithful to God, but rather, in a way, has made alliances with different powers on earth and especially with Satan. So she's known as the prostitute. New Jerusalem, uh, especially when uh, John was writing this book, Jerusalem was destroyed. Same thing with Babylon. And these cities, they stand as symbols representing something. Jerusalem stands as the symbol of God's city, where, people, where God's people dwell. And Babylon stands as where the city of Satan, where his throne is, the place of confusion and counterfeit, leading people into deception. So you have these uh, contrasting uh, uh, patterns. And what's interesting, you also have a contrasting pattern between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. You see, my friends, not so many people are curious to find out what the seal of God is all about. You've got movies about Antichrist. You've got movies about 666. But you don't have a movie about the seal of God. We are fascinated about who this beast is. But I'd like to suggest to you this evening that it's more important for us to understand what is the seal of God. Because if you have the seal of God, you're automatically not going to get the mark of the beast. I'm not sure if New Zealand struggles with uh, counterfeit money, if there is a problem with fake money here. But, you know, America is known for laundry, you know, all these corrupt uh, uh, ideas of fake money. So people that are employed and specially trained to pick up and identify the counterfeit or the fake money, they are not trained in looking at counterfeits. They don't waste their time on looking at counterfeits, but rather they're looking at the original. They learn the original and they say, whatever doesn't match with the original, it's a counterfeit. That's much easier than studying 20,000 possibilities of fake money or counterfeits. And it's the same thing, my friends. Once we learn the seal of God, we will automatically understand what the mark of the beast is because it's not going to line up to that one. So let's begin our journey in uh, unraveling and understanding what the seal of God is all about. We're going to look at two portraits. One is found in Revelation chapter 7 and the other one is Revelation 14. We've seen this picture before. Uh, there's this uh, scroll that is in heaven and it's sealed with seven seals. And every single time a seal is broken or open, there's an event taking place on planet Earth. We're focusing especially on number six because when the sixth one is open, there are climatic and time events. These are the ones that are preparing the world for the return of Jesus Christ. And then we have the, the famous question, you know, the great day of the wrath has come and who is able to... Stand, you know, the famous question we have looked in the past. Jesus is coming on His glory with the angels. The question is, who will be able to stand in the day when He comes? And the answer is given in chapter 7. The 144,000. We have touched briefly on that. We haven't fully, you know, 
finish discussing that number. But also they are known as Israelites. We have covered that topic. You know, an Israelite is not someone that comes from Israel. It's not an ethnic identity mark, but rather it's one that is in heart, accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. And the other thing is, they are called servants of God. And these servants of God, they have the seal of God on their head and the, or the mark of God. And what I would like us to understand now is what does it mean to be a servant of God? Before we look at God's seal. What does it mean to be a servant of God? So understanding the servants of God. Romans 6.22 tells us this. But now having been set free from sin and having become what? Servants of God. The gospel is not just a gospel about knowledge. It is a gospel that sets you free from whatever addiction you might have. The gospel of Christ is powerful, my friend. You lived one life, and when you encounter Jesus, you are no longer the same. He sets you free. You've got things that have hold you back, those chains of addiction, and says, when you are set free, you all of a sudden become servant of God. And the Bible is very clear that it is the Holy Spirit that helps you to have a new life. It is the Spirit of God that convicts you of sin, that helps you to understand, hey, this thing is wrong. It is the Spirit of God that leads you to Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is a merciful and wonderful Savior. And it is the Holy Spirit that enables us to live as servants of God, that we have our priority to worship and uplift God. So how do we receive God's Spirit that helps us to be His servants First of, all, we need to, first of all, we need to believe in the gospel of Jesus. In Him, Jesus, you also trusted, and this is the element of faith, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of His salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the first ingredient for us as people to receive the Holy Spirit that seals us for the day of salvation, keep that in mind, the Holy Spirit seals you for the day of salvation, is to believe in Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Second point, we need to obey or we need to follow God. There are a number of passages in the Bible where God addressing either the Israelites or the people in the New Testament, and he says this, You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Just think of that statement. Is my life just a lip service to God? When I can come together and say, yes, I believe in God? what is actually a heart service, when I am actually willing to obey and follow Him, even though it may not be popular, even though it may not be uh, you know, trendy and appreciated by my family members, even though it may cost my uh, work relationship, am I truly committed to follow God in every aspect of my life? Because it's not looking just for a lip service. He's looking for faithful ones that are willing to obey and follow God. We are His witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who, whom God has given to those who obey Him. We say that it is the Holy Spirit that helps us to become His servants. And the Holy Spirit is given when we accept Jesus Christ and when we choose to obey God, we make an intentional decision to obey Him in every single aspect of our lives. So this leads us to the end time seal of God. And look at this passage, Revelation 7, 3. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. We have already understood that to be a servant of God, you need to have the seal of the Holy Spirit, so you are already sealed for the day of salvation. However, the book of Revelation tells us that as we are getting close to the end of time, you need an end time seal that can be observed by heaven and earth that you belong to God, you are part of those faithful ones until the end. Servants of God must have it. They must have that end time seal. And this brings us to the second portrait. 
that helps us to understand more about the qualities of the seal. First quality is that it is a sign of belonging or commitment to the Lord. Do you like the idea of commitment? may not be very popular, but when you're committing to a relationship, guess what? You're committing and no one else has attraction for you, right? Nothing else attracts you away. A sign of belonging and commitment to the Lord. This is what the Bible says in Revelation 14. Then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, so it's talking about the redeemed, and this is a description about these people. Having his name, Jesus' name, and his father's name written on their foreheads. Bear that in mind. When we're talking about the mark of the beast, we know that those who are worshiping the beast and his image, they're going to receive a mark on their head and on, on their hand and, and forehead. But here we have the redeemed, the servants, the 144,000, not with the mark of the beast, but rather with the name of Jesus and the Father on their forehead. What does that mean? That they belong. God's name is on your forehead. That means you, are, you belong to Him. You, you are identified as a child of God. So what's God's name? God's name is Jehovah. You are, in a way, we can say, his property because you have chosen to. Number two, it is a sign of life cleansed by God's love. Revelation 14 continues. These are the ones who were not defiled with women. And this talks in the context of the prostitute that represents an apostate church. It's about spiritual Sorry, it's about spiritual adultery. When you can, where you can say, I worship God with my lips, but with my heart I'm after the riches of this world, or I'm after this, or after that. So these is, uh, people, men and women, they're not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So this is an act of worship, an act of faithfulness. They belong and they are committed and these were the redeemed. We say that um, those that have the Spirit of God, they are the ones willing to obey and follow. And they are the ones that have the power and desire to say no to Babylon that stands as an apostate church or the prostitutes. And the Bible continues saying, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulations and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have understood that forgiveness comes only through Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us very clearly that those that are going to be redeemed are not perfect because people have struggled and they've reached a state of perfection. But rather they are people that understood their weaknesses and their failures, their shortcomings. And they understood that when they fall down at the foot of the cross, the past can be forgiven. Not only that, they can be set free from whatever sin may hold them back to achieve God's plan in their lives. It is a sign of a life cleansed by God's love. Number three, the seal also represents a sign of worshiping God as creator. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the spring of water. This is a direct quotation from Exodus 20, uh, verses 8 to 11, where it talks about the fourth commandment. And it says, worship him who made... It could have said, worship God. You know, that would have been easier, and save ink and save paper and all of that. But no, he went to the extent of saying, you need to worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Why? Because he wanted you to get the point that the worshiping the Creator is at stake. People are going to forget the aspect of, of worshiping the Creator. So number four, the seal is also a sign of faithful obedience to God's commandments. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. This is a description of God's people at the end of time. Because it's not just lip service. That's right, it's heart service, willing to follow God all the way until the end. 
So what is the outward sign of being sealed by God? We looked at all these characteristics. First of all, it is a sign of belonging and commitment to the Lord. This is just, you know, refreshing what we've mentioned. It's a sign of a life cleansed by God's love. It is a sign of worshiping God as creator. And number four, it is a sign of faithful obedience to God's commandments. What is God's end time seal for his people? It is the seventh day Sabbath. And I'll break it down for you to see how all of those four points are fitting into God's holy day that he has called us to set aside in order to connect with him. It is God's seal for end time events that God's people are going to be distinguished from those that want to follow the beast. Begin with number one. It is a sign of belonging and commitment to the Lord. How can the Sabbath, the seventh day, be a sign of belonging and commitment? Listen to this verse from Ezekiel 20:20. 20, 20. All of my Sabbaths, in other words, keep them holy, and they will be what? A sign. A sign between what? Is a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. There you have it. Sabbath is a sign of commitment and belonging. That we belong to God and He belongs to us. We are in this together. It's like, you know, a child wearing a school uniform and going through town. And everyone can see that that child goes to a particular school based on their uniform and Usually the good principles encourage children to behave wisely as they leave the school because they represent the school. They're wearing the uniform. And God is saying the Sabbath it is that sign that tells everyone that you belong to me and I am uh, you know, in your life presence. Second point, we say that it's the seal is a sign of life cleansed by God's love. How can the Sabbath... Show us that we are cleansed by God's love. Ezekiel 20 verse 12 says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign, same language, between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And that's so exciting because when we take the time to worship God on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, we are reminded that this work of transformation, this work of sanctification, it is not our effort. But rather it is God Himself who makes the work of transformation, who takes our old desires and puts us new design. God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. We need to be recalibrated. And He does that, especially on a Sabbath, because we choose to disconnect ourselves from the world in order to connect with Him in a special way on the Sabbath. Number three, it is a sign of worshiping God as Creator. We saw that. That's what distinguishes God's people at the end of time. How is the Sabbath uh, helping in this direction? Well, Sabbath, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day He rested and He was refreshed. It is on the seventh day that we are reminded of the fact that we have been created by God in His image. He is our provider and He is our recreator, or I should say our redeemer. And lastly, number four, it is a sign of obedience to God's commandments. Look at this verse that comes from Ezekiel 20. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes. Keep my laws and do them. Keep my Sabbaths holy, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. We began by looking at two portraits, one in Revelation 7, one in Revelation 14. Both are describing God's servants at the end of time. And all the qualities, the characteristics are identified in keeping the Sabbath holy. Who we worship, I want you to see this, who we worship will be seen by how we worship. Now think of that again. Who we worship 
will be seen by how we worship. Jesus made this powerful statement. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Throughout this uh, past three weeks, or a bit more than three weeks, we have spent some time looking at the Christian world from a historical perspective. And we have identified a number of teachings that are part of Christianity but have no support in the Bible. And Jesus strongly warns us against it, my friends. And I'd like you to take this as coming from Him, not coming from me. Jesus says, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of man. And God, God's honor is at stake, and He says, your worship, when you choose to worship the tradition and made main, man-made regulations, are not honoring me because you intentionally place the commandments of God aside. Why? Well, probably because we have done this for the last hundred years, so we might as well continue. Well, 80% of Christianity is doing it, so can't be that wrong. My friends, God is calling you to stake a stand, to be true to Him, and to embrace everything that He reveals to you. Genuine worship is obedience to God's commandments. And God's seven-day Sabbath, it is the outward sign of God's end-time seal. So now, once we have an understanding of God's seal, the seven-day Sabbath, this will help us to have an understanding of the mark of the beast. And I'll continue to do some parallelism here, or contrasting pictures. So the seal of God obviously comes from God. This is clear logic, right? But just for our brain, which we have so many cells, thank you, Ian, uh, we need to, to take it logically so it all settles in properly. The seal of God comes from God. Now, the mark of the beast comes from? You guys are an awesome class. Mark of the beast comes from the beast. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark, so obviously, according to the Bible, his mark is, or the mark belongs to the beast. Uh, about some sessions ago, we looked at six identifying characteristics, and we discovered that the sea beast that the Bible passage refers to is none other than the medieval church of Rome, uh, and there was no question about it, which means that the mark that comes, it will come from the medieval church of Rome. As I mentioned in the past, I choose to repeat myself now, we are talking about a system here. We're not talking about individuals or certain people. We're talking about a system that sadly has corrupted the Word of God, and we need to open our eyes and see what's happening. So the mark will come from this particular system. So the seal of God, it is a sign of worship of God. The mark of the beast it is a sign of worshiping the beast. You can see this constant battle, pulling people for allegiance and, uh, and desire to be theirs. The seal of God reveals obedience to God. Now, the mark of the beast reveals disobedience to God or it reveals obedience to the mark. Revelation 14 says, there is, n there is no rest day or night for anyone who receives this mark of his name. Because of this, the saints must endure and keep God's commandments. So you see, the saints are enduring and keeping God's commandments. However, the other ones are not keeping God's commandments. Look on. The seal of God is linked to rest, interestingly. And the mark, of the, re the mark of the beast is also linked to rest. And look at this powerful and short Bible passage. There is no rest day or night for anyone who receives this mark on, of his name. And the Sabbath is associated as a day of rest. Because they've pushed away God's seal of rest, they are experiencing no rest. It is a choice between God's way of governance and beast's way of governance. So the beast mark will come from the church of Rome. It is a sign of worship or allegiance to the beast as we have seen. 
It reveals this obedience to God's commandments, or we can flip it and say it reveals obedience to the beast. And number four, it is connected to rest. So we say that the seal of God and the mark of the beast have some common elements, but of course they're very different. So God's seal is the seven-day Sabbath. The mark of the beast is worship on the first day. And we're going to see together how this has been accepted and promoted around the world. By the way, no one has the mark of the beast as I'm speaking to you around the world. No one around the world has the mark of, this, of the beast at this stage. It will be a decision that will happen probably soon or sooner or later. But, it, but the decision we are making tonight will affect our future decision. So bear that in mind. Look at this Catholic record from 1923. Sunday, or the first day, is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and let that thought sink in. I thought the church is based upon the Bible. But all of a sudden we have the statement that the church is above the Bible, so why bother having this book? It moves on saying, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. That should blow your mind away. I'm going to leave it there for a, for a couple of seconds. Sunday is our mark of, of authority because they, what they're saying between the lines is this. We don't have any scriptural evidence for that, but that's why we believe the church is higher than the Bible or the authority of the church is higher than the Bible. An abridgment of the Christian doctrine, page 58. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals or of precept? Answer. Had she not had such power or authority, she could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day. A change for which there is no scriptural authority. As I said, the, the issue at stake, my friends, is worship. God is crying out for faithfulness and worship. The question was, who will be able to stand when Jesus returns? The Bible says the 144,000, the servants of God, the Israelites, those that have given their lives to Jesus, not only lip service, but it's heart service. They're willing to obey. They're willing to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have the Father's name written on their foreheads. They keep the commandments of God. They worship God, the Creator. And all of these, when you pile them together, you find the beautiful truth of the Sabbath. On the other side, you have the counterfeit. Very close, because that's why you do a counterfeit. You do it very close. So it becomes very hard for people to distinguish. Let's move on with more, uh, more evidence. This, this I, I, I actually had to search for this and I just couldn't believe it. It's one of those statements you read and you rub your eyes and you read it again wondering, is this real? Now, bear, bear with me as we go through this. Perhaps the boldest thing, right? This is a good introduction. The boldest thing the most evolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Look what it says next. Not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense. So the church has a sense. They have a feeling of their own power. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority should logically become seven-day Adventist and keep Saturday holy. You would think that I created that article, but I didn't. That's the beauty of it. I didn't have to write it. It was written in 1995 in the St. Catherine Catholic Church Sentinel, pastor's page. And you can take that, Google, and you'll find it. It's still online. I'll leave it there so you can take the title and, you know, take a photo of it and show it to your friends. My friends, we are dealing with one of the most 
important things of following God and being faithful to Him. Are we following the Word of God or are we following man-made traditions? Are we following the Lamb wherever He goes, as the 144,000 are described? Or are we worshipping rules implemented by people in the past? We said that based on the six identifying characteristics, the, the medieval church of Rome fulfilled the criteria for the, for the beast and implements the mark of the beast. But there's one more thing, the seventh identifying characteristic, and that is the number 666. Here is the wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate. So this is about calculation, the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Bear in mind, 666 is not the mark, right? It is an identification factor that helps us to identify the beast. So it's nothing to do with the mark. As we said, we cannot apply this number just to anyone. It has to be a power that is connected with the beast. It has to be a person or a power that is connected with the things that the beast is doing. You can't just randomly choose someone and see if it matches. And that no one should buy or sell except those who have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we're going to find out what this number of his name is all about. Ancient Babylonians and also Jews, they practice what we call gematria, or gematria, where they added value to the letters in their alphabet, numerical value to the letters of the alphabet. As we said, the number of his name, and it goes on, he's saying it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. We know the medieval church of Rome is a visible church, and they say a, a church which is visible must have a visible head. Throughout centuries, the leaders of the Catholic Church, or the popes as we know them, they carried a name, and the name was Vicarius Fili Dei, which means Vicar of the Son of God. But what I find interesting, and this is just one of the identifying factors, it's not the, the one or the only one, it's just one of them. When you look at Vicarius Fili Dei, you come up with something really interesting. When you add numerical value to these Roman letters, you discover some things. For example, V is the Roman numerical for five. Some of you might be familiar with this. Some, some of you can be the first time when you see it. I is actually Roman numeral number one. C stands for 100. Uh, you can take a picture and look at it online. For A and R, there's nothing. Again, 1, 5. So you've got Vicarius, Philly, Dei. And when you add all of these, you come up with the number 666. Six, six. And what's interesting about this name is it means the vicar of the Son of God, which means the one that is basically God on earth while God is in heaven. So it's a, in a way, it's also a blasphemy against God's presence, omnipresence around the universe. So as I said, this is not the only thing we're using, but we need to, to lay down the solid foundation and then the calculation of the name is added right at the end to the power that implements the mark of the beast and this helps us to really put the cherry on the top and understand that the Bible is true and is very clear and specific in all its statements. So how will the mark be, be enforced then? How it will happen? Bible continues. He, the land beast, talking to the Protestant America, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a Protestant America will play a huge role. They will implement their mark, and we're going to see why. It will be on the right hand or on the foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his 
name. So Protestant America will enforce Rome's mark, and it will be first Sunday worship. Who we worship will be seen by how we worship. If you worship on the seventh day, you pledge your allegiance to God because you keep His commandments. You've got your Father's name. You want to belong to Him. You acknowledge Him as your Creator. When you move away, you end up into a counterfeit system of worship, rebelling, not only refusing God, but worshiping the devil. As I said, no one, it has the beast mark, but the decisions you're making tonight will definitely influence your future. So where are we finding in all of this? Are we moving in the direction that I'm suggesting from biblical perspective? Well, let's look at Church of Rome and their talks about Sunday. The last three popes, John Paul II, Benedict and Pope Francis. Let's begin with John Paul II. In 1998, he wrote an article 41 pages long entitled Dies Domini, which means the day of the Lord. In that 41 page article, uh, John Paul II, he was calling the entire world back to a true worship of God on the first day of the week on Sunday and saying, we have departed from this, but let's return. There were small steps. Pope Benedict, 2009, made this statement. Pope Benedict on Sunday called on Catholics to keep the Sabbath. But what he means by that is the first day. Uh, the Pope said, Western societies had transformed Sundays into days where leisure activities had eclipsed the traditional Christian meaning of the day to devote time to God. And he goes on saying, Give the soul its Sunday. Give Sunday its soul. And then, of course, recently, Pope Francis, 2014, he lamented the abandoning of the traditional Christian practice of not working on Sundays, saying it has a negative impact on families and friendships. Maybe, sorry, maybe it's time to ask ourselves if working on Sunday, Sundays is true freedom. So he's pushing towards the idea, let's close down everything on a Sunday, let's make it a day of rest for the whole world. You've got the Associate Press, Sunday, July 6, 2004. Also, the same message, the same uh, ideology comes from America and leaders from America. In 1976, America went through an oil crisis. We're not going to go into conspiracy to say if it was fake or real, uh, that oil crisis, but this is what important. Harold Linzel. He, he was the editor of Christianity Today, which, which is an evangelical uh, paper, Protestant paper, and this is what he said. All businesses, including gasoline stations and restaurants, should close every Sunday by force of legislative fear. So you say, we need to take these steps in order to ensure the well-being uh, of this world. You as presidential candidate in 1988, Pat Robertson made this statement, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, but what he means is actually the first day of the week, Sunday, not Sabbath. And it says it's a command for personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandate, mandated a day of rest have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state. The reality is this, my friends. Time is running out, not only on my presentation, but also on the history of this world. Everything that we have seen, and I tell you what, I consider myself very blessed to live at this time in world's history. And I consider it a privilege to be here with you tonight to share these things with you. Because I have a strong foundation on which I stand, that is, and that is Jesus Christ and His Word. More than 2,000 years ago, Christ, uh, through His people, predicted things that have come to pass 100% accuracy and fulfillment. We have no reason to doubt God's Word. But what's at stake is our eternity, and the decisions we are making tonight will impact our, this, uh, our, our destiny. Because we are called to choose 
between receiving the seal of God or between receiving the mark of the beast. And I'll tell you one, this one is much easier to get because it's uh, not going to really affect your life that much. Things will go on just like before. But in order to get the seal of God, you'll have to make some changes. But remember the promise that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It is not by might, it is not by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. No one said it's going to be easy, but definitely it's going to be worth it. The issue at stake is worship. Who are you going to worship and when are you going to worship? For too long, the seven-day Sabbath has been trodden on the foot by many people throughout past generation. And tonight, God is the one that is inviting us to address this question. Who will you worship? Because it's not a matter of being ignorant and continuing to stand on a fence or sit on a fence. But rather God is calling us, if you receive His seal, that's worshiping Christ. But if we refuse His seal, we're actually not only refusing to worship Christ, but we're actually worshiping the devil. That's how big this thing is. A number of years I read a story that really touched my heart. There was a, a Roman battalion. They were resting near a frozen lake in winter in Europe. An order came from higher authorities saying that all Christians from the army need to be, in a way, executed. We no longer can have them in the army. And I said, the best way you can do this is by asking every, sol by asking every soldier to worship the emperor. And the Christians will be identified because they will refuse to worship the emperor. The commander of this particular group of soldiers was quite reluctant because he loved everyone in his group. But he was forced by circumstances. So he gave the order those who are willing to remain part of the army and worship the emperor make a step forward. And majority of them did that except for 40 soldiers. The commander was uh, forced to strip those 40 soldiers naked and he asked them to stand on a frozen lake until they would die. Not only that, but when the night came, they lit up fires, and they said, if you give up on your God, you can come and warm up next to the fire, and we'll give you blankets. If not, you stand on the frozen lake and look at the fire. So the 40 soldiers, all naked, nighttime, on a frozen lake, middle of winter, in Europe, they were on that lake, and they were, in a way, singing or chanting, Forty brave soldiers standing for you, O Lord. And they went from hour to hour to hour singing, Forty brave soldiers standing for you, O Lord. And as the commander was looking at them and hearing the words of, of their song, all of a sudden he saw a silhouette leaving the group of the forty soldiers and approaching the fire was one of the, the people that just couldn't bear the pain anymore. And he collapsed next to the fire. But the other ones kept on singing, 39 brave soldiers standing for you, O Lord. 39 brave soldiers standing for you, O Lord. And we don't know what happened, but something really stirred within the commander's heart. That he started to take his clothes off, and he joined the group on the ice. And they changed the song from 30 back to 40. And they said, 40 soldiers, O oh Lord. 40 brave soldiers standing for you, O oh Lord. My friends, Jesus died for us that we may have the opportunity to live for him. That's why he died. That we may have the opportunity to live for him. And tonight, I hope that something is stirring within your heart, that you may take a stand for God's truth, 
for God's word to follow him at whatever cost. It may not be easy, but it will be definitely worth it. That's what the Bible promises. I'd like my friends to, to, to quickly share the decision cards at this moment because tonight I'd like you to reflect on how you can respond to this invitation. Who will you worship? And the reason why we hand out these decision cards is because I want to make it a priority for me to come and, and see you and help you in your journey because I want the decision you make here tonight to be strengthened by God and it will be one that will guide your eternity to respond to God in such a way that uh, you'll remain His forever. You've got a number of questions, four of them, and then name. Question number one that you'll see on your card, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and I surrender all to Him. Some of you have circled this number in the past. Please feel free to do it again if that's the case. But if you're here for the first time, or you have never accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, I appeal to your heart, do not delay your response uh, to this question. Number two, by God's grace, I will keep His seven-day Saturday Sabbath holy. This is not my invitation, my friends. It is God's appeal to your heart that you'll remain true to His Word. For too long, we have followed man-made traditions. It is time for us to embrace the Word of God at whatever cost. Number three, I want to be part of God's end-time remnant. And what I mean by that is that people of God that are going to remain loyal to Him, it's not just about lip service, but it's about heart service, uh, worship completely dedicated to God and to Him. And number four, I want to be baptized by immersion like Jesus. If you want to take a stand and say, I want to share with my family, I want to share with my friends, I want to share with my neighbors, I want to share with whoever is around that I am serious about following Jesus, that I am serious about embracing the seven-day Sabbath, that I am serious about following the Lamb, and I want to demonstrate that in a public manner, that I want to bury my past, I have come to a new understanding of God's will for my life, for the truth, and I want to do that through baptism. Please circle that, as we would like to, to have a baptism, just to celebrate God's goodness in our lives and the things He does for us. So please, prayerfully consider these things. If the Spirit of God is talking to your heart, do not oppose it. And please... Remember to put your name down on a contact number or address, whatever it's easier. And uh, tonight as we leave, we're going to collect all these cards either at this door. Actually, no, we're not going to do that. I'm going to appeal to you something else. If you think that this is that important and you want to answer to God, why don't you stand up from the pew where you are, just come forward, just put it here, I'll bring a chair, and just put it on the chair face down. I'm thinking of those brain cells that Ian was telling us. When we do an action associated with something that we wrote, it's going to be in our mind. So if you're serious about your decision tonight, that you want to belong to Jesus, or you want to keep the Sabbath, or any of them, one of them, or all of them, circle, put your name down, and then come here, leave it, and go back to your seat.
But imagine that this must have been a bit uncomfortable. But I want to thank you, and I hope you won't forget the decision you have made here tonight. And it will be something that will guide the decisions you will make in the future. And uh, just before I share with you what we're going to do tomorrow night, I want to pray that uh, this will be not only decisions on a piece of paper, but there will be decisions that God's Spirit will write on our hearts and on our minds. Let us pray. Father, we, it is such a miracle to witness your grace at work in our lives. We are living in a secular society where the notion of God is uh, pushed aside. But Father, we know that uh, you are real and you love us and you have a plan for us. The issue that is at stake is a major one. It is our worship, our faithfulness. Father, help us not to be deceived. Help us to embrace you, to embrace your truth, to accept the seal of God. Worshipping you on the day that you have set aside from the time of creation. And Lord, help us not to follow man-made rules and regulations. Give us peace, give us the strength that we need in order to swim against the current. Help us, Lord, to, to live like your children in the midst of this corrupt world. Give us... Uh, uh, assurance that the promise that says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me will become a reality in our lives. May you bless the decisions that have been uh, made here tonight and may they reflect your glory now and forevermore. Amen. Come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used... Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program.